I was asked to uh, make a, a mention uh, of the books and the bookstore that you have here. I understand it's a good one. And uh, I have five books there, and that'll take you a little longer than my little time here with you. But uh, the first one is on knowing God's will through knowing His voice. It's in 103 languages, but just one in the library, in the bookstore. And uh, the uh, story, it follows a storyline. It's narrative. So it's a quick read, but it's uh, talking about our intimate relationship with the Lord. The second one is knowing God, uh, uh, the Lordship of Christ. And uh, I start with the story that I'm going to begin with today when I picked up my wife for dead and the out in the deserts, and uh, I learned the lordship of Jesus in a new way. Third is the book on daring to live on the edge. It's on faith and finance. And uh, so the first book is Knowing God's Will. The second's how to do it. The third's how to pay for it. And uh, you might need all three. But uh, it, they say it's impossible to live by faith, but uh, I think we have tens of thousands that are doing it around the world to say differently. The fourth one is, why not women? And I have to say to the women that God made men first. Secondly, I say to the men, God made frogs before he made men. So I would say that creation was good. You know, frogs are good. Better, men are. Best. Now, don't get proud, ladies. But uh, that's, that's a book about ministry uh, that women are having in leadership around the world. God's using them mightily. The last one is uh, the area called about the Bible, the power of the Bible to change any nation. And I give the example of Norway, and I went invited by the king to share this with him. And uh, uh, how did they become the richest nation on earth per capita when they were, in his grandfather's childhood, one of the poorest and the very poorest in Europe? And uh, how did they become so educated when just in his grandfather's time, 90% couldn't even read or write and so on? They had no freedom in their land. They couldn't even go from one village to the next unless they asked permission from the government. And now they are some of the freest people on earth. Or the same thing in Korea. In just a matter of a short time, they went from poverty. And the grandfathers of many of you here in Korea... They went from poverty, deep poverty, total slavery, and uh, total illiteracy to the 10th richest nation on earth today. How did that happen in 25 years? And you can't, you can't pull out the Bible in any case, and I give many cases around the world, and yes, I talk about Japan as well, but uh, as you see the power of the Word of God the challenge is to our generation, let's get the word out to everybody in the world. Every home should have the word of God. It may be in the form of electronics. This is the latest uh, mega voice. It's solar powered. But you can get the entire word of God in any language. You can get the whole Bible on this little mega voice. And, uh, or in printed page or whatever way it is. We must get the Word of God out. And so it's from the Word of God. I, you'll remember on Monday I took the verse in Habakkuk 2.14 that uh, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And today I read from John 17. Jesus spoke, up, spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. And then toward the end, the glory that you've given to me, I have given to them, that's us, that they may be one even as you and I are one, so that the world may know that you sent me. The key to world evangelism includes unity. My wife and I had been driving night and day across the desert. I had gone to the back of a Volkswagen van that had no seats in the back. I stretched out on the floor and went to sleep as the sun had just risen, and she was to drive in the daytime. She had made a wrong turn, was headed toward the Mexican border, 
There in the deserts of Arizona, a tire blew out. The car swerved. It began to roll as it, the tire hit the sand. Roll three times. I was like in a tumbler of a dry, dryer. And uh, I was thrown out. I was unconscious. I knocked unconscious during that time. But I woke up soon, blood streaming down my face. And I was totally confused, disoriented. I couldn't understand where I was, what I was doing. It was the wrong road. As I lay outside in the sand and picked myself up a bit and looked around, there wasn't one person, one car, other than our demolished one, not one tree even, not one building, only low scrub brush. And then I thought, where is Darlene? And I looked and saw her laying some feet beyond me, face down. I crawled to her, rolled her over into my arms, looked into eyes that were open but unseeing and fixed. And she wasn't breathing. I've never felt lonelier in my life. But I heard clearly God's word. It was above me. I looked up. He said, Lauren, do you still want to serve me? The word serve took a new turn in my life. It was totally different than what I'd understood before. I complained. I said, God, I have nothing left. And I think of my things, you know, my money, my car, my education, my future, my plans, my... Everything is mine, but it's gone just like that. And then I thought of my relationships... They too are gone just like that. Nothing on earth that you or I call ours or mine can be kept. Nothing. It's all, all gone except in Christ. When you begin to understand this life in the light of eternity, only then do issue, issues of forgiveness, of justice... And all the rest come into logic or understanding or reasonableness. Only in the light of eternity. When I said, God, you can have it all, God surprised me and and said, pray for Darlene. I had no hope before. Now I had faith because it comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. And I began to pray. And as I prayed, her eyes shut, and she began to gasp for breath. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful gift that was. A Mexican man drove by. He yelled out of the pickup window, and he said, I'll go for the police. I nodded at him. They came almost an hour later, and we, they brought an ambulance. We started in for the hospital 90 miles away. And as we screamed across the desert, the police notified my family in California and said that I'd been in a bad accident, but I would live with a broken back, but my wife would not live to the the hospital. And so there, and I didn't know that was going on, but in the ambulance, God spoke the third time and said, she's going to be all right. I looked at her, her eyes opened, she smiled at me. She doesn't remember it, she was unconscious, but it was God's word confirmed. And she, she is my partner, but she's not mine. She's bought with a price. And as we both understand that, our lives are both fulfilled. And as we understand it is the will of God that is all important, then and only then can we be fulfilled. You have a destiny, but you'll never be fulfilled until you follow Jesus and fulfill that destiny that God has given to you. For your gifts, too, your gifts and callings are without repentance. It's only as you follow the Lord that life has not only meaning, but fulfillment and, yes, joy forevermore. As I began to try to understand what had happened, the first thing that hit me was the power of prayer. But I had a question. Why did I ask God to do for Darlene, what he already wanted to do, and why did he tell me to pray to God and for that? 
I guess I'm the only one that asked that question. But anyway, that was a problem for me at the time. Not a rebellious thing in my heart. No, because I had seen God at work. But I wanted to understand, and I still don't know. (laughs) But I just love seeing the power of prayer change things. And I got a little inkling that, that God, when he created us, Yes, as John Piper would tell you very clearly, better than anyone I know, that we are to glorify the Lord. Why? Because there's something about purpose and meaning when you you try to glorify the Lord through everything that you do. Whether break dancing or drumming or, or anything that you do, you can glorify the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it's the Lord himself that is the glory of God. And we need to recognize that as we glorify him, it is not selfish intent on his part. It's that we may find a way to be a part of him and have fellowship with him. But another part is the purpose of God in our lives. That literally it's God's dream being fulfilled through us. And I'll tell you, God's dream is great. The nightmares of this world are horrible. But God's dream is really great. And as we begin to fulfill what God has said, we can glorify him. And when Jesus says here, the time has come, the time has come to glorify the Son. And when we understand the time we're in right now, the time has come to glorify the Lord all over the world because the knowledge of his glory is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And you and I can be a part of that. Don't miss it. You'll miss everything if you do. As we begin to think about winning people to Jesus, discipling them in the ways of God, sending them out to do the same and multiplying. It's so important to understand what God is saying to us through all of this. It was in 1975 in August that uh, my family and I were up in the mountains of Colorado in a little cabin just enjoying a week in in somebody's cabin they had loaned to us. And uh, a word came to me from the ranger and he said, uh, you have a phone call. I went to take it. It was a friend who said, uh, Bill and Vonette Bride are here in uh, Colorado too, and they found out you were here, and they wanted to see if we could uh, join together and meet up. And they were over in Boulder, so we had a friend that had a little plane, and he took us over there. And the day before, I'd been in prayer with my yellow pad, and I'd written down what the Lord had shown me, that there are seven spheres of society And I'd never heard of this before. I found out even Plato talks about the spheres and and so does uh, Abraham Kuyper and many others. But this was something new and fresh for me. And I wrote them all down, put them in my pocket, went over to see Bill and Vonette. We'd just shaken hands and I was sitting down pulling out my little list when Bill beat me to it. And he said, Lauren, look what God has shown me. This is the way we can disciple a nation. What he was talking about was Matthew 28. Now Mark 16, 15 was the word that the Lord gave me as a 13-year-old to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's my scripture. I let others use it. But in that, first of all, the go means a change of location. You've got to move, whether across the street or across the sea, but you've got to change your location to do the will of God. There's something in it that makes a difference. The second is all the world. That's geography. The third, preach. That's communication. The fourth, the gospel. That's the message. That's the good news. And the fifth is demographics, every creature. But whenever we think of the every, then God has given us in Matthew 28, the corporate. This is the individual, Mark 16, 15. The corporate is... I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now go, therefore, and disciple all nations. I used to blur over that one. Yes, you do it a person at a time, but you are to look for the alls and the everys in the Bible. Take them as yours, and it will revolutionize the way you think and the way you act. Then as you see your part, you see it in the light of unity. What I was to learn about unity was I had not only prayed 
and understood that God answered my prayer. But within days after that, I found a group of ladies in Los Angeles having their Thursday morning prayer meeting at 1120, the time of the accident. A Mrs. Wilson heard from God and said to the other 11 ladies, we're to pray for Lauren and Darlene right now. God's just spoken that to me. And they began to pray. As I was praying in the desert, they were praying in Los Angeles. Another lady was praying. She was a church secretary in uh, Fremont, California, up in the Bay Area. And the Lord told her the same thing. Her name was Bernice Koff. Now, I didn't know the 12 ladies, but I did know Bernice. She fasted her lunch for us. And I began to realize that prayer, like Abraham was to learn, when God said, I could even save your city from a natural disaster through united prayer of 10 righteous people. I don't know how that works, mathematically or any other way, but one can put a 1,000 to flight, two 10,000, think what, you know, 14 could do. Or maybe there were others I didn't know about. Never think that you're the only person. But as you begin to pray, you can pray in un- unity with people that aren't even there as well as long as you're in unity with the Lord. And the Holy Spirit unites those prayers and does things that are bigger than we could ever ask or think. And right now, the prayer movements of the world, I think of the Protestant prayer movement starting with the Moravians, praying 24-7 for 100 years out of Harenhut and and in other places where they went. I think of those that uh, down through the years, the Korean church, as they became known as the people that prayed, and they prayed night and day. Back in the 70s, I began to hear about them worldwide, that Those people know how to pray. And I see now the modern day prayer movements, the 24-7 movements around the world, and they have blended together in a beautiful way with the mission movements as they, they, the leaders of the prayer movements and the mission movements like people like Dr. Douglas, Steve Douglas of Campus Crusade and head of Wycliffe and the head of this and that and the other and, and the YWAM leadership and so on. They were praying and committing to each other together because the two are not separate, they're one in Christ. And as we begin to understand that unity, we can see the world understand the glory of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, and that God sent him in order to redeem the world. As, as we see that uh, prayer is important, we must also uh, disciple. And as we disciple, following evangelism, we're walking on two legs, And you will never finish the Great Commission if you only evangelize. You can never finish the Great Commission if you only disciple. So you have to have the both. But it's really a three-legged stool, as I'll mention the third in just a moment. But the, the area of discipleship, I believe, has to move out of the church. Yes, be in the church. But move out into the other six major spheres And these spheres, number one, they include the area of of, uh, the home or family. And of course, the church, that's second. Third is the school, education. The fourth is media or public communication. The fifth is celebration, arts, entertainment, sports. The sixth is economy, which includes not only production, sales, and service of the business realm, but also technology and science, the innovative side. For with that, you actually increase wealth. With the other, you spread wealth. And as you understand, the seventh, of course, is government in its three uh, three phases. And and Isaiah 33, 22 tells us those three areas of the legislative, judicial, and and executive branches. And, And then down into the affinity groups below that, And as you start with those seven, those seven are in every primitive society in the world as well as in the complex societies. And when we go into those areas with the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting those prayer groups, those discipling groups, I like to call them life groups, living in full expression of Jesus. And as as we 
uh, set up those groups and then make them viral. Unless they're viral, it won't take place. You'll notice here on the uh, screen uh, at this moment, I see it before me. Yeah, there it is. Jesus had a multiplication plan. And uh, you start with the, the area up here, 11 disciples, 109 of those in addition to the 11 that he had discipled up close. You remember Judas uh, uh, failed and left him. But a total of 120. Now in your lifetime, this is a model that Jesus gave us. In your lifetime, could you disciple after winning 120 people? Now others, we may share tasks, that's okay. But just think about what that would mean to you. Now, Jesus had up to 500 disciples. When he told them, I want you to go and wait, how many obeyed him? They understood the Lordship of Christ gives you the opportunity of being there at the moments of history that you wouldn't want to miss after the fact as you look back. And the other 500, the rest of the 500, other than these 120, they missed out on the greatest thing of history. And my challenge to you today is don't miss your window of opportunity to be a part of the greatest time in all of history to do some mundane thing in missing God's will. You will have missed something you will regret the rest of your life. Or even maybe, no, you won't cry in eternity except once. But you will miss something great. And so if you will think about what Jesus did, he left with really 120 obeying him, maybe 500 altogether, be nice to them. But as you'll think about this, these 11, he kept close. We can never disciple the body of Christ in 20 minutes on Sunday morning. It won't work. You have to pour out your life. You have to spend time and in depth. And whenever you do, you disciple the leadership that should then do the same. They should disciple 120, including 11 others. What would happen if you did that? You would have now 121 leaders and 1,320 that would be a part of those that you have discipled. In nine cycles, you will go, eight cycles, you'll go to 212 million people discipled. But in the ninth cycle, you will have reached the entire world. Now, this is just mathematics. And if we could, uh, you know, the problem is people. If we could just get rid of people, we could do the job, couldn't we? (laughs) Well, that is the job. But mathematics shows us the power of multiplication. Don't go just for addition in your life. Multiply your life the life of Jesus in you through discipleship. I was reading last night a report from our leaders, Liz and, and uh, Steve Cochran from India. And they, they've spent 26 years out there. I remember when they went through their first training school in Hawaii in 1980, I think it was. And uh, so it's more than 26 years. But they were talking about as they look back on the 26 years, they mentioned Narendra, Narendra, and he was a convert, one of their early converts. And today, this young man, who's not so young now, he's in his whatever, 40s or so, his father was a high-level Hindu priest. But in North India, there's, he has over 300 staff that are serving under him. Many of those that he has not only discipled, but many that he has won too that are a part of this. And he has over 50 different kinds of ministries that are going on there. He's also a leader of a network of believers that numbers over 7,000. This is one man's life that has just multiplied out very fast. Or right now, over 250 different ministries in South and Central Asia involving television, radio, different training schools, church planting movements, orphanages, street kids, homes for widows. They have micro enterprise for 10,000 farmers. They've got all kinds of things going on right now. 
And this is talking about two people multiplying. Let me just tell you about Liz when she started with us. She was single when she went out to the the subcontinent. And uh, she was leading teams up in Nepal. She speaks Nepalese fluently as well as other languages. And as they were preaching up up in the mountains of the Himalayas, they were arrested, all 14 of them, chained together and and held in prison there. We call her one of our jailbirds. (coughs) Her brother, Dan Bauman, has worked many years in, in Afghanistan. We've worked in every year, every day in Afghanistan since 1970. And uh, he was one of those that uh, he speaks uh, the language fluently, but he was put in prison when he went over to share the gospel in Iran with two death sentences on his head. And uh, that's her brother. Whenever the mother heard about her son getting in prison, she was with our our Youth with a Mission Center, one of our training bases, she prayed. She's from Sweden. She's prayed, Lord, hold Danny there in prison until you get all of your glory. That's a mother's prayer. I <laughs> said that once to Danny, and he says, oh boy, what a mother. But uh, she understood why he was there, and she also understood why God could release him. And when you begin to see lives over a period of time, I'm coming to you at this time in your life. What will yours be like as you look back? You can have the greatest opportunities all before you now. Choose God's opportunity. The third area I'll just mention uh, briefly here is the area of mercy ministries, evangelism, training, and mercy ministries. We are deeply involved in this, and I really believe in this. However, the Bible says that you're to do justice. You're to love mercy. And you're to walk humbly with your God. Corey Tinboom was one of our early teachers in several of our schools. And uh, I remember the story she would tell about Peter Hartrock. And he was one of her fastest runners when they stole a hundred babies from the Nazis and saved their lives by putting them in the homes of, uh, of the Dutch people. And Peter said to her one day, he said, I think we do the most important work in all the world. And dear Aunt Corey, she said, Peter, it is important what we're doing. But don't forget, the most important thing is to save souls. She said, just before he was executed by the Nazis, he wrote her a note. He said, I now know as I face eternity, the most important thing is to save souls. But I would say that that three-legged stool includes the words of Jesus. In Matthew, uh, in Matthew 25, you will see it. You'll see it in many parts of the world, uh, of the word. But you'll also see that idolatry and injustice are two of the most mentioned sins in the Bible. So we are to stand against sin in every way. But we must always include the mercy side and love the mercy, even as we do justice. And I, I was just in uh, a few weeks ago in, in East Africa in one of our places, Arusha, outside of Arusha. They were working with the Maasai's there. They have several preschools. They have uh, several clinics that they're running. They have planted many, many churches and all the rest. But one of the things that got the attention of everyone was an act of mercy on their part. They weren't doing it to get the attention. But they, they saw the people were... were they, they had no rain. They had uh, dusty uh, little villages and so on. They planted over a half a million trees. And in doing that, they literally started to change the climate for those people. Now, that was an act of mercy. And we, we do that as an act of mercy, but in the process, it solves injustices that you could find there economically in other ways. They, we work in uh, over a thousand locations with children at risk. That means orphanages, street kids, and all of the rest. But I want to close with this. We must evangelize in a way it will become viral. But we must disciple in a way that it will take people in depth. And we must have mercy ministries in order to move people 
from the temporal to the eternal. And that must be our goal always. And when our heart purpose is there, we will see what one atheist asked me as I was speaking. I've spoken in universities and and colleges in every continent. And they always ask the first question, or second at least. If God's a God of love, why do the innocent suffer? And I said, I'm glad you asked that question because the one who was most innocent suffered the most so that the most guilty could become as if they were innocent. And that's Jesus Christ and his cross. And that's the answer to all issues of injustice ultimately and eternally. But in the meantime, we must do both with all of our hearts in all the world and do all three, really, that we are taking care to show the mercy of God even in our reaching out to people who have gone through so much injustice. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, I thank you for these minutes that I've enjoyed and and the hours and days now here on campus with these dear young people. And I know they are filled with potential, potential to change the world. Just 11 of them could do it. But think what 2,200 could do as they give themselves 100% to you, to your cause, to your dream for them particularly, and in general to reach every person in the world with the good news of salvation. And Lord, yes, to show the tender mercies that are there in our hearts and our compassion for those that are suffering all over the world. And I've seen it, I've been brokenhearted many times around the world looking at the injustices that occur. But it's only through you that we'll ever find ultimate justice. But in the meantime, let us serve, Lord, with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. First, you, by loving you. And then let us love our neighbors as ourself, which will include, Lord, reaching out to whatever their need is. And even right now in YWAM, as we feed those 72,000 young people, Uh, those children, rather, up in Korea, North Korea. Oh, God, I pray that you'll win them all to you and that we will see, as we've fed them for years now, that many of them will understand the love of God in a place, Lord, that is so rugged, so harsh, so unjust. And I thank you that you'll do that for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You're watching WETN, a service of Wheaton College. For information on our programs, call 630-752-5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A video program guide is available at wetn.org.